Hello, everybody. It's, this is my sixth talk at the Blender conference, and I'm very excited to be here. Thanks for coming to my talk about making modular sofas and digital furniture twins. My name is Thomas Radicke, and I work for Casa Rista, which is a young furniture company based in Graz, Austria. And the company was founded in 2020, which was kind of a bumpy start, because uh, you might remember what was there at the beginning of 2020. Um, fortunately for us, uh, many people uh, recognized that they might need a new sofa during the pandemic lockdowns. <laughs> and uh, this gave us a, a pretty good head start, I think. And uh, this is our team. and. Uh, May our, this is also in, in our showroom, so um, we have uh, showrooms in different parts of uh, Austria and Germany. But actually, our main point of sale is our website, which has a web configurator, that, which you can see on the right side. And the configurator has a 3D WebGL preview of the sofas uh, and other furniture that you can freely configure for yourself to get a unique sofa. And these 3D models and textures and everything that's in that 3D configurator represent the last four and a half years of my work at that company. I made all of these models and all of the textures and all of these little tiny preview pictures that are next to the options there. And today I want to talk a little bit about how I made all of these. And um, you might know the traditional approach to making product photography is just putting everything in a photo studio, but that brings its own baggage. Like, you have to store, you have to actually build sofas, you have to store them for the photos to be taken, and then you have to somehow get rid of them after you're done taking the photos. You either sell them or you store them or, or you, you scrap them. And that is a huge waste of time, energy, and money. And on the other hand, all you need is a computer and a blender head in front of it. So. Um, yeah, that's what I'm going to talk today about. I, I want to start off with uh, building the models, and also I want to talk about um, how I make the materials that go onto these models, and how scripting helps during the entire process with tiny everyday scripts, but also with things that manage rendering huge amounts of uh, product shots. Also, I have a couple of results to show later on. So, the building process usually starts with collecting all the data that you can get, in, get your hands on. And uh, the, the usual process with creating furniture is you have some designs like that design sketch in the upper left, and you send that off to a manufacturing partner that produces these um, to your spec. Uh, however, these manufacturing partners usually have their own knowledge and processes for building all of these things. and they usually don't share the data with you, even if you're the company that makes it. So uh, what you do get, however, is a prototype. And these usually get delivered to your showrooms, and then all is left to do is go there and take countless photos, videos, measurements, and scans of the real piece of furniture. And usually my photo gallery looks like this after one of the scanning sessions. This is just a tiny amount of, of what I have saved on my phone. And uh, you might notice these are a lot of photos, but there are also some videos in there. And uh, I use these videos really a lot to uh, reconstruct all the data. <laughs> because uh, yeah, just collecting isn't going to work. Um, fortunately, there are a couple of very nice applications that really, really help reconstructing that stuff. And uh, you might have seen a couple of these. Um, these mo most of these apps are about uh, photogrammetry, but there are also uh, Nerf and Gaussian splitting apps in here. And uh, lastly, there's also FSpy. A few of you might know it already. This is a, an app to reconstruct the, a singular camera perspective based on a single photo and uh, the perspective lines. So it's not truly a reconstruction app, but it helps if you have footage that is otherwise not reconstructable. And here are some examples of what that reconstructed data might look like. The one on the top left is a splat that was taken with an iPhone. And um, the one on the lower right is a mesh that has been reconstructed with Mesh, la mesh Lab, no, Mesh Room. 
I constantly confuse the two. And um, these are actually very nice references for when you start modeling all of the pieces. So, of course, you, if you have really good scans, you can model on top of them and do a retopo. But more often than not, I catch myself just looking at photos, loading the photos as background pictures in Blender, and then modeling on top of them, and also looking at my huge gallery of reference photos all the time until I'm done with a single prototype. And can you guess how many modules are visible here in this prototype? How many do you say? Three? Six. It's five, actually. Very close, uh, because the two armrests are mirrored versions of each other. So this is actually one module. Uh, but yeah, you have the left and right seating elements, which are different sizes. You have the extender on the front, and you have that storage element in the middle. So there we go with five modules. And uh, usually, this is the point where I say, congratulations, Thomas. Well done with the prototype. <laughs> or are you? Uh, unfortunately, that one prototype just represents one of uh, dozens, if not hundreds, of modules that belong to a product series. Um, because all of these usually come in at least three different styles, classic, casual, Nordic, and then each of these modules also have multiple different sizes, and there are module types like long chairs, open-ended ones, corner elements, and so on. Some of these have functions like the storage in the, in the long chair. And then when you think you're done, uh, the leather brick hits you because you have to do all of that again for the leather versions. Because as you probably know, cows don't come in infinite size. So you cannot produce infinitely large leather patches. That means you will have additional seams for the leather versions. So yeah. Um, <laughs> this is what a typical project file looks like for me. Can you guess how many collections are in there? <laughs> it's a hard guess. Let's show a little detail shot here. So this is, this is a file where all of the modules are arranged in all three dimensions, so it makes it easier for me to compare all the sizes, see all the different versions next to each other, and then immediately see if one of them is maybe different, has a, some kind of modeling error or so. And for your convenience, I took a screenshot of the outliner. <laughs> Actually, that's, those are 20 screenshots <laughs> um, stitched together. And in fact, this is not even all of the collections, because on the top right there, you can see there are a couple of collections that have like little colorful markers. Uh, I forgot to expand those. These would form yet another entire column to the right. <laughs> So yeah, these are about 1,200 different collections for modules. And if you're creating something like this, you have to be absolutely meticulous in naming them. I know everybody hates naming their objects, but it is absolutely critical, I can assure you. <laughs> and obviously, this is not our only project. Um, this is yet another project file for Nairobi, our bed sofa, which can be extended. And uh, here's Denver. This is the, the product line that you saw the prototype from earlier. And yet another one for dining furniture. Um, although I have to admit, the tables and all the other smaller parts are a little bit crammed in there in that little concentrated area over there. <laughs> um, but yeah, once you have all of these modules, you naturally want to use them in other scenes. And um, people have suggested, why don't you use the Blender Asset Manager? Uh, I have reasons not to. <laughs> um, my other process is actually more suited for our workflow. The workflow is you have the main project file uh, where all of the modules are in, and you want to use all of those modules in another project file. So uh, a good way is to link to the original collections. However, when you change something in the original project file uh, and you add a new module that hasn't been there before, this will not automatically get linked into your other projects. So it will be missing. And then good luck trying to find out which one of the 1,200 collections you have is the one you just made when trying to relink everything. So the solution to this is to just link the entire scene block that contains all of these modules, because then you get all of the collections linked in your other scene file as well. 
And uh, the usual process is then like that. You link to the original uh, project file. Scene is loaded. And then you can just uh, go to the Add Collection Instance menu and you start typing the name of the modules, like M, Rio, Armrest, A. And then you go again for a seat element, and uh, you repeat that a couple of times for all of the different types of modules that you need. There's a corner there. There's an open end coming up next. And you arrange them all a little bit. And I chose to prefix all of the modules with M, uh, M space so that you can easily find um, the modules that you're supposed to be instancing in, the, in that editor. So yeah, at some point, you're done. And you can apply materials to that. Let's skip that Let's next part to the finished sofa. And yeah, this is, this is then an inst ver instanced version of that sofa uh, with the material already applied and in a scene with an outdoor environment. And as you might notice, there's already a material on there. But before we can apply a material, first we have to make the material. And I can't just go and uh, use any pre-made uh, material assets from any market, uh, marketplace, unfortunately, because that's not the fabric we sell. So we have to digitize all of the fabrics ourselves. And I have a quite sizable collection of fabric samples at home right now. Uh, not just fabric samples, but also wooden samples. And I also have two boxes of stone table plate samples, which weigh 10 kilograms each. These were fun to be delivered. And um, usually, you either scan or photograph these samples somehow. And I employ also a technique where I light up the samples from four different sides to be able to reconstruct the normal map. And um, when you, no matter whether you do that with a flatbed scanner or by just carrying a lamp around your sample and taking four photos, you will eventually end up with a distorted fabric sample. Um, that's because fabric samples always move uh, in themselves. So no matter how careful you are in handling them, they will be distorted. Uh, I found a fun way to undistort these with Blender by uh, putting them on a plane and uh, playing around with vertex distortion and subdivision and so on. I could prob probably fill another hour-long talk just about talking, um, talking about the undistortion technique. <laughs> so um, let's cut this a little bit short. After some clever editing of layer layering the, uh, the undistorted scans on top of each other, extracting a diffuse map and uh, reconstructing a normal map from that, you end up with a set of uh, different textures. Some of them are special textures that are used in the PBR shader to maybe separate different parts of the, of the material, not just roughness maps, but also masks for recoloring purposes and so on. There's also a brightness variation map here, which just represents one type of variation, large-scale variation that you have on your fabrics. Because all of these texture samples are just 15 by 15 centimeters size. And when you just tile them next to each other, they look awful. Even if you equalize all of the brightness differences in them, you will still see that is repeating texture. So we need some variation. And um, when you have multiple color variations of the same material, it only makes sense if you make one neutrally colored base material and then uh, recolor it on the fly in other materials. And this is why I use node groups for that. So I make a node group for the uh, initial base material and uh, build it in a way that it has one or maybe two or three color fields that I can use then to, on the fly, recolor all the different color versions. And these are all linking to the original base material node group. So that means if I need to change the shader in some way, I can just go back to the initial node group, do my changes over there, and all of the entire fabric family will have those changes. That's pretty convenient. And um, this is what a finished material sample looks like. This is a review file that I usually just render for my boss. So to tell him, here, look, that's finished. <laughs> Does it look OK for you? <laughs> and Usually it does, and then I can concentrate on fixing UV errors <laughs> because uh, some materials are actually sensitive to how they are rotated. Uh, you might have heard the term uh, 
fiber nap or fiber direction. That is, if you, if you have um, certain types of fabrics where you, when you stroke over it with your hand or so, you can see that, uh, that it changes colors. That is because the fibers are being bent in a certain direction at that point. Um, I found a fun way to simulate that using a second normal map on top of the first normal map. Um, but if you have a fabric like that, errors in your UV map uh, will be very apparent, as you can see on the left. And to combat this, I also made a little shader that recolors my testing texture based upon UV island rotation of that part. That makes it really pop out in, uh, in the editor, as you can see on the right side, uh, which makes it really, really easy to see which parts are rotated wrongly. And uh, fortunately, you can switch all of them into edit mode at the same time, and then just select all of the islands that have the same wrong color and rotate them the, the right way up. I think I have created over 300 materials in the last four and a half years. Most are recolors of base materials, but uh, nevertheless, uh, quite, quite a collection, I'd say. And uh, what you can see here right now is a, an overview rendering of all of the materials that I have in my library. And you could probably imagine that it is a, probably a pain in the butt to render all of these by hand. And this is why I use scripts. <laughs> and I really love how Blender does not force you into certain ways to, um, to use the scripts, but it gives you the freedom to either just type into the console or run scripts from a text file, or you can even run scripts via command line um, from a batch file and uh, just double click and be done with it. And um, some of the tools I have developed to help my workflow, one of them, for example, is a seam generator. I think the seam on the right side is a little bit hard to see. I have a better screenshot coming up next. But uh, that seam generator is a very simple uh, add-on that basically one click generates a couple of geometry on top of uh, freestyle edge marks. Um, basically, the thing just picks up the edge marks of any object, ex extracts them, uh, converts them to a curve, then adds a little cylinder, cylinder and a bevel and an array modifier and then combines all together to make these neat uh, fake stitching curves, basically. I think here you can see that a little bit better. Uh, this is one of our no newest additions to our lineup, a relaxed chair. And I've, I'm, I'm using these seam generators uh, on many objects at the same time um, because sometimes you need to adapt the model and then regenerate the seams. You might think, huh, that would be probably a, a good job for geometry nodes. Yes, but unfortunately, geometry nodes cannot access freestyle edge marks yet. So it stays a script for now. Let's have a look at another very often used script. Um, I just said earlier that my texture files are 15 by 15 centimeter samples. So obviously, all of the UV map sizes have to be correct because otherwise you'd end up with something like that uh, on the left side. Um, the script I'm doing, I, I consider a little bit of a hack. Uh, what I do is I, I create a 15 by 15 centimeter mesh a plane, and I add that to the mesh I'm trying to unwrap. And then I unwrap the entire thing because I noticed that Blender keeps the relative sizes of the UV islands together. And then I just look at the last four vertices in the list of the mesh because that's the plane I just added and then I can see the UV coordinates and the size, and I can calculate the real-world size from that. And that gives me instant correct size scaling with just one click of a button. And yeah, as I said, um, some might consider this some kind of a caveman way of doing th things with scripting, but yeah, hey, as long as it works. <laughs> and uh, here's another script. This is actually the most important script and also the longest and most complex script that I've written for the company. It is a recursive batch rendering script which solves uh, a problem that many people have that are in product visualization. That is, you need uh, multiple shots from the same product from multiple angles and maybe also multiple variations. And I solved it in that way that the script picks up all of the cameras and all of uh, the collections in a scene and combines all, all of these views to be rendered and also adds in a list of materials that you can, uh, can define. So I have two examples on, on that page here for a scene structure. So 
if you have like a single camera, two collections, and a single fabric, you get two renderings, one of each collection with that camera and that fabric. That clearly doubles when you just add a second fabric. And it gets even more when you add a second camera to the mix. So from two to four to eight, you got to be careful with that. So here's a more varied example where I have added a sub-collection. My script is also working recursively, meaning it descends into cascaded collections and does all of the stuff again in a smaller scale. And that allows me to have, uh, for example, that sofa one example here. That is a static part of a sofa with sub-collections containing just the different feet. So the sofa stays the same while the feet get added as recursive rendering options. And that gives me uh, the front camera with all of the sofa plus feet combinations and also a local detail camera inside the other collection that just renders that part of the collection in all fabrics, of course. So yeah, that's what this, uh, this script basically does. But let's, let's go overboard a little bit here. Uh, let's assume you have 10 sofas which need to be rendered with five feet each. That's already 50 combinations. And then you add three cameras to the mix, so 150 views. That's already a lot to render. But now you want to have that with your entire catalog of fabrics available. That is 15,000 renderings. And you can probably imagine that this is very quickly going overboard. Uh, I have calculated that if you render that in 4K, which takes about 20 minutes each, um, you have about 208 days of rendering time continuously. And uh, obviously, you have to reconsider at this point and say, OK, maybe we should reduce the number of fabrics and also re re reduce the resolution and maybe use some clever upscaling uh, afterwards. Um, and this was actually the case when I tried to, to do that for the very first time, like creating a mass rendering. And uh, I managed to cut it down to just three days rendering time. So let's have a look at uh, some of the results there. So this is one of the more recent examples of, I think, 20 different sofa combinations combined with like six, seven or eight different environments. Uh, this was done for our marketing department, so they get something to pick from. Um, and let's see if the video is working. It did when we tested it. <laughs> Come on, video. video. No, this is a website. Video. Well, the second video works anyway. So here we are. <laughs> this is uh, the result of a single blend file that contains all of these pieces of, uh, of individual collections. And um, I basically just hit render once. And the definition of the, of the script, of the render script, did all of that in one go. There's also a clever thing that I, um, that I built in, that is, if, if one of these renderings is broken, I just let it continue rendering all of the rest. And then I go back, just delete the files that, uh, that are broken, fix that in my uh, blend file, and start the script again. And it recognizes which files are already there and don't need to be rendered again, and just skips them. So I can just re-render stuff that is broken. So more examples. This is not a result of my rendering script. This is actually an example for my material fabrics. Um, this is uh, rendered. And um, this is a, actually an example of what our family, uh, fam fabric families look like on the website for customers to pick from. And uh, there's one more, which is uh, like a promotion shot. Very few people actually saw that. But that was also done with the combination rendering script. I have to skip forward a little bit. We're already done with the time. <laughs> uh, this is a poster shot for our dining furniture. I really like that one. Uh, the left side looks a bit barren because that uh, shot is actually supposed to be cropped square in the middle. <laughs> yeah, there's uh, the relax chair again. And um, yeah, this is, this, is, this is what I've been doing for the last four and a half years. And uh, obviously, I did learn a couple of lessons. 
you never have enough references. No matter how many references you think you took, you don't have enough. The next best thing would be to have the actual sofa at your home, but as you can imagine, with an entire sofa, that's gonna be a bit problematic. So taking a lot of videos and pictures is the way to go. Also, name your meshes and your collections and your instances and cameras and materials and lights and basically name everything. It makes scripting so much easier. <laughs> also, it doesn't have to be perfect. Uh, you probably know the saying, uh, perfect is the enemy of good, and I think that is absolutely correct. Um, you also have to recognize that there is no single tool that uh, can do everything, and also your workflow will probably change, so stay flexible and don't focus too much on one thing. If it doesn't work, just try it in a different way. And lastly, learn scripting. So, in conclusion, I can say, Thank you, Blender, for being so versatile that it allows me to do things my own way and uh, to experiment and find new ways of achieving what, what needs to be done. And um, yeah, all I can say is uh, thank you. There are interesting new uh, projects on the horizon. I'm looking forward to new cool Blender features. Um, but we are also experimenting with NVIDIA's Omniverse at the point. Um, uh, at the point of sale, so that's going to be on our website in a while. So again, thank you very much for coming here and listening to me, and uh, have a wonderful evening. <laughs>